Hello and welcome to my 2020 Gwent crafting guide. I did this last year for 2021. It was well received. So I thought let's do it again for 2022. Here is how this works. I look back at the past year's worth of meta reports, which is trying to rank the best decks in the game, game of Gwent for each individual patch and try to find commonalities throughout each faction. I'm trying to identify the cards that keep getting carried over patch after patch into the best decks. That way, if you're new to Gwent or just want to expand into a new faction that you haven't have no, that way, if you expand into a new faction and you don't have a lot of cards for it and you need to p figure out which staples you need right now to get going, you have a rough idea because obviously when a patch hits and your archetype gets nerfed, you don't want to rebuild from scratch. Let's dive in. I want to start off with Northern Realms. Northern Realms is actually really difficult. It's a very weird faction for staples. So the reason is they have several different archetypes that all often, often like devotion. And so duels, alumni, siege, commandos, and witchers have some, but very, very little overlap, especially when you look like a bird's eye view at all five archetypes. The commonality between all of them is Amphibious Assault. Amphibious Assault is the one staple, one staple card this entire faction has. It's a fantastic card. It's deck tutoring for a faction that likes Devotion. So in that case, if you were going to get one card from this faction, get Amphibious Assault. With that said, I'll show you at the end. You can get it from the rewards books now. So you can save. Don't, don't spend 800 scrap on this. You can just get it. There are a couple other cards that are starting to rear their head as decent cards that may start to become staples. Your heart often creates a card called Pact. So 13 for 11 spread across two bodies because you can pack a smaller unit than your heart, which is really, really strong. You have Shani, which lets you resurrect units from your grave and you prince on Sayus, which is really good stuff like inspire inspired zeal and shield wall as a way of removal these strongs these cards are good for the future northern realms being how vault or considering how volatile it is one of my takeaways from this meta report search was don't make this your first faction because when your deck gets nerfed in northern realms it gets slaughtered because you, you will need a ton of other different northern realms cards without much overlap to get back into the game with having a competitive Northern Realms decks. Looking at the chat here, good to see you here, Kasari. And SVKBW, six months lit indeed. Thank you for the sub. Thank you for helping all the support. I really, really do genuinely appreciate it. Unbelievable. Six months, half a year. Wild. The next faction I'm going to hit is Monsters. Monsters was so weird. They have one staple. One. One staple in the entire higher faction and it's parasite which isn't even a legendary card it only costs 200 scrap and i apologize about the brutal premium damage an enemy enemy unit by six boost an allied unit by six one of the two and then organic works of arrakis swarm dealing six damage or boosting something up you have and spawning one drone it works of kelly kelly loves removal and boosting stuff it does both it works really well in relics as one of their key cards as to use as removal the card's just fantastic it's super versatile super powerful across many archetypes but monsters has a little bit of that northern realms problems kelly is a deck that doesn't want to spawn many units arrakis swarm loves spawning units relics are point slam they start to branch out you death wish of all kinds of stuff going on however unlike northern realms monster decks are almost never devotion very rarely do they go into devotion. They do have commonalities across them all. And that is the staple neutral cards, which we're going to get to at the end. When we get to the end, you'll see that there's a handful of cards if you craft that if one monster deck gets nerfed, it's not too hard to move to another one because you'll be able to carry over a bunch of major cards. The monsters is a better faction to start with than Northern Realms by far. And as for the recommendations in chat, I agree. Stuff like Toad Prince is interesting. Johnny Talus is interesting. But Johnny Talus is a classic old card, but hasn't been used throughout the entire year. And Toad Prince just got 
really heavily buffed, so we'll see. We'll see. This is my 2020 crafting guide, SVK, or SVKBW. 2020 crafting guide for players who are just trying to figure out how to get into a faction and not get burned by a patch. On to the next faction. We're going to go over to Scoyatel here, who actually has a number of staples. Just like how Northern Realms was broken into Must Have, Amphibious Assault, which you can get by via the rewards map, and then some on the edge, Scoyatel is the same way. They only have three cards, which are Must Haves. Force Protector. It's a fantastic card, works really well as Nature's Rebuke, acting as a body with removal if you change combo the Nature's Rebuke Bronze card with it. And Bountiful Harvest made it better as well. Another powerful Bronze Nature card to replay. You have Ease and Grimm's Council. Brand, look at a random Dwarf, Dryad, and Elf. The Nature card, so if you're running Symbiosis, great. Gives you three options and is not limited to Bronzes. You can look at Golds in your deck. So you have a high chance of getting some card you need. Whether it's just a simple play to keep the game going or get a bomb from your deck. Super, super pumped. I mean, it's a great card. And it survived meta after meta. And last but not least, we have Fav. Play a nature card from your deck. There are a lot of powerful nature cards, including using Grimm's Council. Fav sees a ton of play. There that, you know, it's definitely worth considering trying to craft it. Even though it's like a boring tutor, it's a really good card. And again, let's get this Easing Grimm. And Easing Grimm is. Beautiful. Beautiful. Three cards on the edge. Call the Forced. It's only really run if you're running a Devotion deck, which occasionally comes up. Uh, there are some, uh, there are Nature's Gifts, Symbiosis, Oriented, Ama Dryad, Stacking It Up, Devotion decks, and they'll use Call the Forced. If you're not doing that, though, it's kind of getting pushed out in recent metas by Royal Decree. Because Royal Decree lets you get any unit you want you don't get to boost it, but it's also nine provision. So you, again, you lose a nature's tag. So sometimes it sees it sees a fair bit of play. It's on the edge. Dimless is another one. It's a re more recent card, but it's so strong that I'm willing to put it here. It's just so strong. It thins your deck twice. Pretty much guarantees you round one. It's powerful. It's aggressive. It has a lot going for it, and it's been around long enough that I don't think it'll see more any nerfs. So I like it. I'm willing to call it out. And Gezras is the final card I'm gonna call out. Seen play on and off, but with the rise of things like Simless and the recent leader dump, which had Saskia in it, the 12 point slot for Scoyatel is getting a little bit more cramped, a little bit more cramped. CDBR is more and more willing to print high provision bomb like cards across faction to faction. So I get a little mixed. It's been a year hat since having him. He sees play on and off, but I do worry about his future. And yes, this list is only epics and legendaries. They're, it, Bronze cards are pretty easy to craft. 80 scrap a piece is not too bad, so I'm gonna just assume that. Moving on further, we're going to Nilfgaard. Man, this one's super complicated, guys. Nilfgaard has undergone a lot of chains. This year, it went from one style of play to another, kind of. So we started the year of Masquerade Ball being the big deal. You could play disloyal aristocrats like Joachim to proc it. Later on, they would change it so you had to play Aristocrats on your side of the battlefield. That threw the whole faction into disarray. And then it went through a period of like edgy emo Nilf edgy emo Nilfgaard. Flogging decks, for example, was a big thing. Re you know, revealing card or putting cards on top of your deck so they point slam it out. All these weird Colgrim decks, all kinds of weird stuff was going on. And then we get back to like the end of the year where things have stabilized to this more assimilate style. The important part here, take care, friend of Aine. The important part here is that there's one or two cards that have always survived the whole thing. First card, Yoakim. Even though he's just a disloyal aristocrat, an epic 200, key card. Prox assimilate and works really well with Ku, which seems still playable after the provision nerf. It used to be nine, now it's 10. So keep an eye on that. But this seems to still be playable. This card combination is insane. It's thinning, it's points, it's assimilate procs, it's wild. The next stable card is Yenvo. I still don't know how this is not 10 provision yet. But the ability to say, I'm gonna take my opponent's best card, put it on top of my deck, and then play it for my own for nine. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. Insane card. Final staple card, new, very new, is Dead Man's Tongue. The ability to banish two bronzes from your deck and typically you get 10 or 11 points off of this is just so much value on one card. It's not going anywhere. 
maybe CDPR will eventually give it the eight provision tag or eight provision, eight provision level it deserves. It's a little too strong at seven, but they've been reluctant so far. Rather, we have to get to the other controversial part. Terra Nova, Brathens, and Furcart, or specifically Terra Nova and Brathens, just took a one provision nerf. They went from 10 and 12 up to 11 and 13, respectively. These were staples throughout the entire year. Nerf just happened at the end. Will this change Nilfgaard forever? I don't know. They're really strong cards still. I'm just a little sus. A little sus. I'm, I'm putting them on the edge for Nilfgaard. In addition to that, uh, Aphrodite, welcome back. Welcome back. In addition to that, I want to put Furcart on the edge. And powerful thinning card lets you just 3 for 7, play a special from your hand. Kind of like Roach for cheap. It gives a lot of stuff spying, which is really good for Terra Nova. I don't have a good read on how critical Furcart is in terms of having to have it alongside Terra Nova or if Furcart can really stand alone. I'm not sure about that yet. So we're going to see. Time will tell. Time will tell. Those are my thoughts. The big ones again. Ku, Joachim, and Yenvo in Dead Man's Tongue. Dead Man's in particular, just 200. No brainer craft. No brainer craft. Maybe the most important craft on this list. Yeah, no one, no one likes Rians. No one likes Rians. Who wants to play Rians? On to the next factions. Skellige is on my list for notes. Skellige. They only have a handful. Thawblood Totem and Kadutch continue to be insane cards. Especially Totem. This card's old. The ability to put down two four-point bodies, so you're spreading out the points, and then make them the six-point bodies. Beautiful. No Fukusa. Recent card and just took a one provision nerf. Hence, I'm not putting Fukusa on the list. I think I want to see. I want to see her. I want to see her persist for another year. The Dutch continues to provide insane value, particularly the ability to just like play 11, 14 for eight. If you can get two heals, so it's four, a plus the Bear Witcher. Okay, so four plus eight, 12 for eight. 12 for eight's great. It's a body, you can carry over, a lot of flexibility. Just such a powerful card. Kadutch has been one of the most powerful cards out of way of the Witcher from last year and continues to be a monster. As for on the edge cards, have to call out the Coral Brenna, the discard package. One of the most powerful deck thinning packages in the game. Coral just finally got nerfed from eight to nine. I have a feeling it's still good enough to see a lot of competitive play. But with that said, I want to see Coral and Brenna make progress. I have also, looking at meta reports, seen a deck that just ran Burna without Coral. There is a world where you abandon Coral and could potentially get Burn Up. I'm not 100% sure that's the case because Mask of Obros, the draw discard stratagem is so good. They did some work on it this year. It's a fantastic card. So I would speculate these are going to be good enough to keep seeing play. But Sabla, Totem, and Kadutch are the safest bets. And Kadutch is craftable from the rewards book. And we're going to go through the rewards book in a bit at the end. Just to show you what is or is not craftable. Next, Syndicate. Syndicate is a dumpster fire. They have a ton of staples and key cards. Four key cards, two on the edge. Diggy, Horson Jr., Vivaldi Bank, and Flying Redanian show up in almost every deck. Diggy is often... God, he's just a monster. He's an engine... That profits nine. A nine coins can often equal more than one point per coin. Even if we treat it as nine coins equals one point a piece, which is the lowest value you can really get with them. Nine plus four, 13. 13 for an 11 with an engine. But oftentimes those point coins are being sent, spent on stuff like Philippa or Sea Jackal, which get you more than one point per coin. Diggy has been in every, every successful Syndicate deck. Keep an eye on this guy. He's actually been too good for a very, very long time. Durham, I think that's a fair call out. Uh, Tiger's Eye is very, very strong. And same with Masca Oberos for Skellige. Those probably deserve to be on this list as well for both factions. Lower priority because they're just stratagems. But if you hit a lot of your staples, hit those as well. That's a good call out, Durham. I agree. Next, I want to call out Horson Jr. Devotion. With a nine point reach, it's it, it's perfect. Gal or, uh, Syndicate doesn't mind devotion if this is the payoff, right? You get to deal six, and then you could always use fee with insanity, even if you don't have coins, to kill it. Kills anything of nine points or less. It is a powerful card. It's also a one for one spender, but of course, they have to be three strength. Just an insane card. All around monster. 
Of course, if you're running this, you have trouble with things like lack of a Neuromancy and Royal Decree, which we're going to get to. The Vivaldi Bank continues to be an all-star. Profit three, and you get to dig into your deck, spend little coins, but then you get what you want. Beautiful. Beautiful card. Deck control, when you look at things like Isengrim's Council, and now we see Vivaldi Bank is key to a successful deck. Flying Redanian is also a monster. It's basically three points every round. It's difficult to deal with. It's frustrating. It keeps coming back. It's just a great card. Fantastic card. Like this, this is such a great craft. The ability to keep having this extra deck thinning as well. Because you often go devotion, so thinning your deck's important if you want to get good stuff like Siggy. So it thins your deck, keeps coming back, a lot of carryover. Unbelievable. As for calling out to our the stratagems. Yes, things like Magic Lamp, Crystal Skull, Mask of Oberos, and Tiger's Eye are all really strong. But they're more like a cherry on top of a cake or a sundae, as opposed to the meat that really makes the decks work. So I'm fine kind of putting them on the back burner, but really Crystal Skull is really strong, has seen a lot of play. Magic Lamp's the same deal. Mask of Oberos is the same deal, and Tiger's Eye is the same deal. Four best stratagems in the game throughout the entire past year. But again, cherry on top as opposed to necessarily being the make or break part of the deck oh actually let me go back to syndicate because i missed two comments which is the on the edge cases jacques has seen a lot of play as a 12 for 12 and that has a spending ability you're having make one for one off of him so he's a, he is a threat and he's also point slam if you have better things to spend coins on professor especially the rise of bounty has seen a ton of play six for 12 effectively deal four damage and then profit four which is a lot of bang for your buck a lot of bang for your buck so keep an eye on both these cards they often see play they're usually not together though. it's usually one or the other i think jacques in particular is a pretty safe craft uh with recent support for fire sworn cdbr has shown they haven't forgotten about that so i like i like me some jacques last but not least Neutrals. This actually might be the most important crafts in the game. There are five key ones. Or Neuromancy may be the best craft in the game. 13 provisions. Pick two cards out of your deck. One per round. It's insane. It's just a ton of value. It enables a lot of decks. And it's mind-blowing. Mind-blowingly good. Play whatever you want. We'll get to Sunset in a second. Heatwave, one of the most premium removal spells in the game. It just basically says 10 provision. Solve a problem. Whatever your opponent's tallest thing is, kill it. Your opponent gets a scenario, banish that artifact. Incredible card. Yeet shows up in every faction. Mushy Truffle is a newer card, but I'm see I feel fine putting it on this list. Because even after a provision nerf from 9 to 10, it still sees plenty of play. And that is wild to me. When a card sees play after a nerf and a lot of it, I'm pretty I'm comfortable making the call here. As a way as a good card to craft it's it can be carry over six points by not spawning golden froth you have to play a bonded unit from your deck meaning you have now three bonded units in your deck typically two bonded that you normally put on at bronze level and now you have a third so you're more likely to get value just a great all-around card and it creates two units so if you're playing Nilfgaard assimilate it's a lot of proccing maxi's probably worth calling out she sees playing on on and off and for 200 she's an easy craft that's fine. I'm willing to put I'll put her on the edge. We'll add her to the list. We'll get to her. Next, after Mushy Truffle, Royal Decree. Dropped from 10 to 9 this year. And a 9 provisions, the ability to play any unit from your deck is tons of value. Again, tutoring is really key for a lot of these decks. You want consistency. Card games care about consistency. Heat Wave, Mushy Truffle, Royal Decree, or Neuromancy, and a ton of different archetypes. So we see we're just focusing on golds today. Sunset Wanderers is more unique. It really shows up and it shows up in a lot of factions, but much more niche. And when it shows up, it's decks that want to be mean. It's a lot of free carryover. It's very threatening. It makes round one brutal. And if you, it's still in your hand and still in your hand in round two or three, puts your opponent in a tough spot of how many extra points they want to give you in the final rounds. Sunset is a beating. Keep an eye on it. And if you like a particular archetype, it may be worth crafting. Because even if, like, Nilfgaard, um, Nilfgaard Tactical Decision loves this card. Well, if they nerf that, Gallagher Reckless Flurry likes that. If they nerf that, it usually shows up in, like, a Raka Swarm. Another thing. It hops from faction to faction, but it's loved a lot. Xavier is a good call-out, I guess. 
It's kind of more the utility. I'll put them on the edge. Put them on the edge. They're very... Both are dependent on things. These four in particular are Neomancy, Heatwave, Mushy, and Royal Decree. Super safe crafts. Sunset depends on the deck. Safe craft, but it'll be more faction... You know, I'll hop from faction to faction. While Neomancy, Heatwave, Mushy, and Royal, we'll see play in all of them. Maxine Xavier, as chat is pointing out here. Two utility cards. Xavier is one of the best graveyard removals in the game. You can't craft it though, you have to get this from Thronebreaker. Likewise, Maxi. If you buy Thronebreaker on the same platform you've Gwent on, get all the Thronebreaker cards. Xavier is one of them. Maxi is pseudo carryover, where you just get to make sure you're going to draw better cards than average. If you draw average card cards or have below average cards coming up, pick your worst card, put it on the bottom of your deck, and then shuffle it back up and put that bad card on the bottom. Basically, giving you a second shot to draw something good. Cards are useful, they see play on and off. This depends heavily on the meta. This depends kind of where the power of the game is. I will say for Maxi's case in particular, 6-5 used to be a great stat line. It's not a great stat line anymore. He's getting power crept, so keep an eye. Ah, uh, you can craft the Thronebreaker cards, but not premium. Interesting. Never mind. That is the case then. Okay, you can craft the Thronebreaker cards, so you can craft the Xavier. Better just to buy Thronebreaker and have a good time, though. So those are my initial thoughts on the best cards to craft for 2022. They feel free if you come into this video halfway through the year, dig up some meta reports, see what people are playing. But if you want to get into a faction, that's what I would personally target. You can also feel free if you want to go extra far, compare this against my 2021 video and see what commonalities carry over from 2021 to 2022. Now I need to show you, very important, that some of these staple cards are actually pretty much free to get. So if we go into the reward book, this is a tutorial reward book. Let me move over here. If we were to open up the tutorial reward book, you can see that you can unlock these trophies and you start getting free cards. And oh, there's all the forest. There's a, uh, <clears throat> one of the on the edge cards I called out. Let's see, what are some of the other ones you get? There's force protector, staple card. This used to be a staple card. It might still come back, but haven't seen it in a long time. The upper end of Squiatel is getting squeezed. So just by going to the reward book here, the key takeaway is... Double check, I'm not missing anything else. Call the Forest, Popco Gale. So you get Call the Forest on the Edge Staple card, and you get one staple if you come up here. Forest Protector. This is very easy to do. You can get through this entire thing in 10 games. Especially if you're new to player, if you're a new player and they're giving you a bunch of stuff. Northern Realms had really one staple card. So looking at them all, Natalis that was called out as a way to search up Amphibious Assault. I did not include him in my list, but he is a good card, so there he is. Amphibious Assault is given away for keys, which is great. And Prince on Sayas, another on the edge, an on the edge card right there. Ever Shadow, thank you so much for the Prime. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Prince on Sayas is right there. Fantastic craft. Next faction, we have monsters. Do we got? They have a, like, I think monsters doesn't really come with the stable card because it's just parasite. But just some general Oh, there it is. Never mind. I lied. It's right there. I lied. There it is. There it is. There it is. Just go get your stable card. The other cards are good. This is the best card here. Don't even need to craft it. Nilfgaard, do you got? Ah, no, 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 no. Best you have here, I think, in my opinion, is Brathens. On the edge, we'll see how much play it, uh, it's how much it sees play. But with that said, the cards generally there are very good. Gilgas, last but certainly not least. Let's see what you have here. Nothing too staply for Skellige, but that's okay. There is another book I can get you one of the Skellige staples though. If you go over the way of the Witcher, and you go to Arnegad's Faction Tree, you can get Kadutch for 10 keys right over there. You have to unlock that uh, that tree, though, by going into Way of the Witchers, and actually navigating from starting node over to Arnegad first. And then you can get Kadutch for just a few keys. These are my opinions on terms of what are the best crafts and how to get some of the cards for free without having to worry about saving up scraps for them. I hope it helps you if you're different deck building choices. And if you like what you see, click like and subscribe below, and I'll see you in the next video. Shout out to McRandar, surname81, Winston, and Ahmed Oddly for all their generous support on the Patreon.